Good morning. My name is Christine Brother Taylor, and I am the chairperson of the special education department at Darien High School. Um, Dr. McCarthy is actually um, having some technical difficulties, and so he is logging in on a different device. He is unable to hear us. Um, he is the director of special education services at Darien High School. Uh, at, for the secondary at Darien Public Schools. Um, I know that you can't see us on the screen, but I will just um, say people's names so they can introduce themselves. And hopefully by the time we finish the presentation, you'll be able to see our faces. So I'm just gonna go across my screen. Um, I'm gonna start with Meg Emanuelson. Oh, look, video. Hi, everybody. Oh, I'm hi. Megan Emanuelson. I'm the director of guidance for grades six through 12. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, Katie Hall. So the morning announcements are on right now um, at school, so hopefully you can't hear those, but I am Katie Hall. I am one of the special education teachers here at Darien High School. I currently am a case manager for juniors, and I co-teach two sections of ninth grade English. I can't see any of you, but it's nice to see you all. <laughs> um, Dr. Williamson. Good morning. Um, I'm Kate Williamson. I'm one of the school psychologists here at DHS, also with the announcements happening overhead. Um, I am working with uh, 12th graders this year, as well as some of the ninth graders, along with my counterparts. And you'll learn more today about uh, who the team here is in terms of related services. Nice to meet you all virtually. And you all know Teresa Fox. Hi, I'm Teresa Fox. I'm the department chair for special education at Middlesex. Uh, Dr. McCarthy, fingers crossed, volume's working. I apologize about that. I uh, tried multiple devices and it still didn't work, but now it is working. So uh, whatever uh, restart button worked. I'm Scott McCarthy, a program director for special education. Nice to see you all. Uh, Mr. Sufyan. Hi, I'm Rashid Sofian. I'm a senior case manager at the Darien High School, and I also happen to coach three sports here. Um, nice seeing you all virtually and looking forward to answering some of your questions. Mr. Rivero. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Rivero. I'm one of the assistant principals here at the high school. Thank you for joining us today. And last but not least, Ms. Ellen Dunn. Good morning, everyone. Just uh, a, a long to hear what everyone has to say and welcome all of you. We wish we were having a nice hot cup of coffee uh, at, in the chill zone at the high school right now with you. Um, but there will be brighter days. We'll do it. We'll do it in the fall, hopefully. Um, but we just welcome everyone. Uh, you're in wonderful hands as uh, Joan said earlier with a wonderful team here and uh, we're excited to meet our incoming ninth graders and welcome all of you to the DHS family. Enjoy the presentation. Super. So I am going to share my screen and we will be able to start. So Dr. McCarthy. I think we are a few yeah. slides ahead. Sorry about that. All right, so I think we went through introductions, but uh, this slide just gives you a sense of uh, the staff members who are at Darien High School in, in the case that um, after the presentation, you'd like to reach out to any of them. We thought we'd give you um, a little bit of uh, information, some fun facts about the department, just so you would get a sense of, of the amazing supports that are available at, uh, at Darien High School. So, um, So we have about 265 students who have IEPs at Darien High School. We have 16 full-time special education teachers, including one special education teacher at Fitch Academy. We have eight full-time school counselors. We have four full-time school psychologists, uh, including one at Fitch Academy. We have two full-time speech and language pathologists, one full-time social worker, a department chair of special education, one director of guidance, and then we have itinerant OTPT Eight assistive technology and behavioral supports. So we wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of, of, um, of uh, all of the work that goes into uh, to um, 
welcoming our eighth grade students into ninth grade. So I'm going to turn it over to Megan Manuelson, our Director of Guidance, to talk about what that looks like. So hopefully your eighth graders came home and very excitedly told you that they met the high school counselors virtually the week of January 19th. So um, the, the high school counselors zoomed into their classes to talk to them a little bit about life at the high school, what a credit is, what electives are open to them, and to start to get them thinking about um, what they might want to choose for electives and creating some balance and to get really excited about some of the clubs and activities at the high school. So that took place the week of January 19th. Um, on February 1st, you should have received an email um, linking to what we're calling our curriculum book this year. Unfortunately, um, we weren't able to gather together in the auditorium like we do in a typical year to present um, our curriculum to you for ninth grade and to show off some of our beautiful instructional spaces. So we did assemble um, a virtual book uh, it is in an email and it's also posted on our website, both on the front page of the Darien High School website and also on the guidance website. So we hope that you will look that over with your children and, um, and, and learn a lot and hopefully they'll get even more excited about coming to the high school. This um, coming week, um, the eighth grade counselors, Jenna Jennings and Emily Barazeki, excuse me, my light goes off periodically, um, and myself will be in the eighth grade classes with them, helping them to select electives in Aspen. So um, the, the eighth grade teachers and the department chairs are busy putting together their academic recommendations. And then we'll be in classes to make sure that students are selecting um, the proper number of electives and that'll happen this week. Um, at the end of the week on the 12th, um, the parent portal will open in Aspen and you will be able to see um, what those recommendations were in terms of placement and also the, the electives that your children chose. Hopefully they're discussing that with you at home. Um, and then um, the middle school will be communicating if, um, if you wanted to appeal a decision to go up a level or if you wanted to go down a level or change a language, we have some processes for that and that'll be clearly communicated to you. And then um, we hope, we hope, we hope, fingers crossed that in August we'll be able to do, um, we put on a really great freshman and new student orientation, typically um, it's the day before school starts. It's a really wonderful event. Um, we are hopeful, obviously, we'll be able to do it in person. Um, but we learned this past year that when we can't do things in person, we do a really nice job of coming up with an alternative. We did do a virtual orientation for our students this past August. So that's a little bit up in the air TBD, but there will be some kind of orientation in August before students arrive. So along with um, Megan and the other school counselors coming in to talk to students about course selections for next year and working with their teachers for that, um, the eighth grade teachers do a lot of planning and collaborating with the um, teams at the high school to prepare for the students articulating up. Um, they have had opportunities in the past to go to the high school to observe classes. Um, they collaborate very closely with the special education teachers and the service providers at the high school to um, discuss the different options for students. Um, we will be spending some time with teachers um, being able to get together, the service providers and special education teachers to get together to share information um, and to make a plan for articulation. We also um, have been working very closely with DHS um, on all of the PPTs and planning for that um, and who will be involved in there. Um, the articulation PPTs are an opportunity for us to speak about the transition from eighth grade services to ninth grade services because they do look a little bit different. Um, these meetings will start on February 22nd and they should run until about March 12th. Um, invitations are going to be start being sent out this week. Um, you will see, receive a notice of your child schedule PPT via email. And due to COVID restrictions, we are having to host these meetings via Zoom. Um, the meeting attendees are the team that has typically attended your child's PPT up until this point, along with a special education teacher from DHS and any related service providers at the high school for any services that your child may receive. Your child is the star of the PPT. Um, since this is at the start of transition planning, they are invited to participate. And in non-COVID times, they would be coming up to the high school. But what we are doing this year is your child will be given a space 
uh, a space within MMS where they can attend the PPT and they will be able to have that conversation in a confidential area. Um, and uh, we look forward to meeting you all and uh, starting this collaboration. So the articulation 504s are fairly similar to what Christina just described. Um, the timeline for those, they are they do take place mid to late April. You will get um, an email with the schedule that usually comes from Sue Laura at the middle school. It will be during um, via Zoom and it is the typical 504 team. And we also have the high school counselor who attends the high school counselors are the case managers for the 504. So they'll be attending as well. And um, similar to the PPT, we do encourage student participation in those 504s um, as they are interested in doing so. Um, so we do something every before the start of the school year, and it's called Round Robin. Um, it's an opportunity for the case managers to meet with all of the students' general education teachers and discuss the student's profile, discuss accommodations, discuss just the student in general and what supports will be helpful for them moving forward. Um, just as an example, I'm with juniors this year. I'm lucky enough to have been with them for the past two years now, so I know them really well. So round robin for me was an opportunity to meet with all of my students' teachers, talk about the IEP, absolutely talk about accommodations, things that will be especially helpful for the first day of school, things like preferential seating, any classroom environment accommodations are really important to communicate at these meetings. I usually let the teachers have about a week to get to know the student and then I will follow up with all of them um, and see if they have any questions about accommodations, see what they're noticing so far, anything we might need to change. Um, and the benefit of having the students for a few years is that you're able to speak to them more so as a, as a person and as a whole and you know what they need to be successful in the classroom. As Teresa mentioned, the high school team does meet with the eighth grade team and we will ask those questions. You know, What can I share with the high school team? What do the high school teachers need to know? So we have this meeting every August. It's great. Um, it's a great way to come back to school, see all the teachers, introduce your new students. And then we also have this, if necessary, at the semester change. Um, this is particularly, uh, this happens with mostly upperclassmen where they'll, where they'll take a half year elective and then switch. So we'll meet with the new teacher, talk about the, the new class. Um, freshmen, sometimes they'll change, but if necessary, we are, we're in constant communication throughout the year. Um, but this is just a nice way to, to get started and kind of discuss the students. Good morning again, everyone. So, so this is my 12th year at DHS, and, and one of the common questions I get, especially for new parents that are, that are coming up that haven't had a high schooler come through yet, is what's the communication chain? You know, what's, who do we go to when we are looking for something? Um, and so here's a general rule of thumb. I will say, feel free to reach out to anyone at the high school. There's no one person that like, will not answer your question or anything like that. Oftentimes, if we don't know the answer, we'll get it for you or direct you to the right place. But just for your own time's sake, in general, if you have a specific question about a grade or a class or, or something to that effect, always feel free to reach out to the general education teacher. Um, if it's a question about an IEP, um, something related to an accommodation or, or uh, looking at what the progress is overall for a student, the case manager, um, or if you have someone that has a related service uh, provider, reaching out to that person would be the, the, the go-to person for that. You will get to know your case manager, as I'm sure you have down at Middlesex also, but your high school case manager, you will get to know very well. Uh, Katie Hall and, and Rashid are two of our case managers that um, build very strong relationships with their students and their families, and, and I'm sure you'll have a similar experience next year. Um, next is the school counselor. Every student has a school counselor. They have the same school counselor for all four years, um, and that person is another go-to person for just about any question. Now, they do focus a lot on the student's personal uh, social emotional needs, um, obviously questions about transcripts, schedule, things like that. And then eventually when it comes time to the post high school planning, um, students will meet with their counselors uh, periodically throughout the year. We have a guidance seminar that meets every quarter depending on the grade level. So your child will have contact with that school counselor also. But that is another person that if you don't know where to turn to, 
reach out to the school counselor first, and then if they don't have the answer for you, they'll direct you in the right direction. And then us as, as administrators, as, as assistant principals, um, again, um, I deal with one part of the alphabet. Uh, Mark Bazzoni is another one of our assistant principals, and Kate DeMullis is the third assistant principal here. So you can feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we typically will attend the, the, the PPTs and be the administrators at your PPTs. Um, the upcoming articulation meetings, we'll try to be there as much as we can for those. And then next year, in you know, all your annuals and triennials that happen once we get to the high school, um, we'll also be a part of those too. So again, the, the one thing I can't stress enough is if, if you have a question, if you have a concern, please feel free to reach out, whether it's email, phone call, um, what have you, just, you know, please, please, please feel free to reach out. Um, I think next we're going to go back to Megan and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the supports in the uh, 504 at school. Okay, so um, scheduling. Um, as a mom of teenagers and high school students, uh, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you as a new high school parent is don't really try and wrap your head around our schedule <laughs> um, quite yet. The students are whizzes at it. They really do. Um, they learn by doing. Um, they get a matrix that they just follow in order. Um, if you have older students, um, you know that we used to be on an HRAP one. This year we're, we're using a block. Um, you know, going forward, we will schedule for eight periods, which is what the important piece of um, information is as we start to head into um, scheduling season and articulation season. And um, we have some, some services that are um, general education services, then there are some special education services that we'll talk about later. Um, but the question is always, how do some of these services impact their schedule? So at the articulations, we will certainly help to, when we're looking at related services and what kind of supports are recommended for a student, we'll try and really map out and make sure that there's certainly room in the schedule, how it will fit, and we'll definitely explain this in greater detail when we're talking about your individual student. Um, we have team talk classes in some academic areas. Um, those are classes that are taught by two general education teachers. So, um, so there'll be two content area teachers in the room. Um, there's really not a huge impact on a student's schedule. It's not um, in the sense that, with the exception of the fact that there aren't that many sections of it. So if they're in a team taught, they might have to be in a particular period. Um, you may have heard of our lab model. This is also available in some academic areas. Um, and this one impacts the schedule in the sense that it is an additional three periods um, in a student's schedule that's really designed for some pre-teaching and reteaching. Um, re so that has a little bit more of an impact on the actual schedule and how many things we can fit into a schedule because it's in a whole separate period, um, three additional um, periods in our cycle. Um, related services, either, either counseling or speech or um, OT or PT, anything like that. Um, that's obviously determined by the PPT in terms of frequency. And again, at those meetings, we'll take a look and see, see where they will fit. Um, students do have study halls and free periods and, um, and periods opposite their labs. And so we'll be looking to make sure that we can certainly make that work within a child's schedule. And then guidance seminar, I'm a little biased, but I like to call it the best period of the week. Um, each student has that once um, for one quarter. Um, freshmen will have it second quarter. And that is a time that's during a study hall or, or not, you know, it doesn't interfere with their related services, um, but it's with their school counselor. It's developmentally relevant um, topics. It's a, it's a curriculum that we've written um, and it's we're, we're about five, five meetings or so. It's really wonderful for the, the counselors and the students to get to know each other. And again, for us to share important information. So that, that's figured into the schedule um, during second quarter. So as I mentioned, the school counselors are the case managers for the 504 plan. So if you have a student with a 504, the case, the, the counselor will be your point of contact. Um, they are reviewed at least annually um, so that we can certainly make sure that the accommodations are, are appropriate. We will reach out to you to schedule those um, on an annual basis. Again, we'll be having those spring articulations um, so that the eighth and ninth grade teams can communicate. We can get to know a little bit more about your student. Um, we can move those accommodations from being sometimes what it looks like in eighth grade might look a little bit different at the high school. So we talk about how those services and those accommodations might fit in a high school model. So that'll happen in April. Um, and again, um, we'll reach out to you to schedule, but certainly if you believe that the 504 plan needs to be changed, if there's a, 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 um, a development with your child's needs um, that would warrant a change to the accommodations, you can request a 504 meeting at any time.
So we'll come back to me now. So Megan mentioned before some of the general education supports that we have, um, whether it's the team taught, the lab classes. Um, obviously, we have a, a counseling suite similar to, to Middlesex where we have a whole slew of um, uh, mental health professionals that, that can assist our students. We have three school psychologists, um, our social worker. We have a connections counselor. We also have our school resource officer um, that is in our counseling suite too. Um, we feel that um, you know he is a resource and, and is part of the group that's up there and is very much a, a, a part of what they do on a daily basis. Um, we also encourage students to get extra help from their teachers. Um, obviously, this year with the pandemic, it looks a little bit differently. Um, but in a typical year, we have students that will meet with teachers before school, after school, during a common free period. Um, we have spaces, again, not right now with the pandemic, but once we're through this pandemic, we have spaces throughout the building that are known as our learning connections rooms where students for specific content areas can go and get help from a teacher, whether it's a, a math teacher, even if it's not their own math teacher, it's a math teacher that's assigned there for every period during the day, and they can get extra help in Algebra one or Geometry. Um, we also have a National Honor Society that uh, provides peer tutoring for our students. Um, and finally, you know, I, I know in Middlesex they have um, like a homework club. Uh, we don't necessarily do that, but we do have an academic support center where for students that need some help and are struggling and need some of the maybe some of that executive functioning type of uh, support, our academic support center is definitely available for students too. This is outside of what students receive in special education. So in addition to students with an IEP or a 504, um, even for students that don't have any of those supports, these are available to them also. Um, Christina, next slide, please. So our team taught, again, there, there's two general education teachers that are in there. Not every content area has this model, uh, and not for every course, but we do have it for, for some of them, um, uh, especially in ninth grade. Um, it, it involves having two uh, content area teachers that help uh, break down the ratio in the class, so it's a smaller student ratio. Um, it, it's not a special education teacher. This is not a co-taught support, uh, but it definitely helps assist students that are trying to um, navigate some difficulties that they have um, in, in a particular content area. So um, the, the team taught is definitely a, a, a nice model. Uh, the lab classes, um, it, it's an additional period that meets. Uh, so let's say your student's taking Algebra one and they need some additional support in math. Um, they might be recommended to have a lab that meets an additional period uh, with a math teacher, obviously, and it doesn't meet every day, like a typical Algebra one class, let's say, it'll meet three out of the eight days in our, in our rotating schedule. So um, students will get that extra support, and it's a much smaller setting. The, you know, our labs are anywhere from four to maybe eight or nine students or so at a, at a time in there. So it's definitely an opportunity. Now, because it does take up an extra period, there are times where it might have a, a, a conflict with the student schedule, so they might have to choose between do I go for the lab or do I take ceramics, and that's something that the school counselor, whether it's your middle sex school counselor or your high school school counselor, can help uh, work out. But this is a support. It's not um, a, a, a graded course. It is something that attendance is taken, and students are definitely expected to attend. Um, but it's not something where they'll receive a grade on a transcript or a report card or anything like that. Next slide, Christina. So, um, oh, one back to oh, fix. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, uh, we're also fortunate to have a support structure called Fitch Academy, which is, I believe, probably in year three or three now of, um, of operation. Fitch Academy is an alternative high school program um, that is available for about 24 students per year. Uh, grades 9 through 12 students can apply to the program um, uh, on the website. It's a, it's a fairly brief application. The, the emphasis at Fitch Academy is on um, uh, sort of project-based learning that uh, is collaborative and um, is supportive. The, the students who attend Fitch Academy um, are, are typically students uh, from the larger high school environment is just not necessarily conducive to their to their learning experience. Um, these are students who may experience anxiety at times or uh, may struggle with um, you know social situations or, or feeling connected and and sort of find a home in a space that's 
um, that's got sort of a, a more comfortable approach to education um, and, and uh, a very close knit group of students and, and staff. So uh, this, I, again, students can apply in their eighth grade year um, for ninth grade. Students can also attend Darien High School and then at any point apply if they feel that uh, Fitch Academy might be a better fit for them. Once they apply, they have a brief interview process with the team at Fitch and then uh, have a shadow day there to make sure that they, they feel like it's a good fit for them. And if it is a good fit, um, then, uh, then they, they would transition their academic programming over to Fitch. The, uh, both general education students and students with IEPs and 504s are able to apply to Fitch. Hi everyone. As Paul uh, Ribeiro started to highlight, um, we have many mental health supports um, available to students here at the high school. Um, and again, these are available to all students. Um, we are here to support all 1400. Um, and as uh, we identify additional needs for students, whether it's through a 504 plan or an IEP, um, we individualize those supports as necessary. Um, I like to joke that our guidance department is the, a cul-de-sac of help up here, um, as all of our offices are uh, near one another, myself, two others, full-time school psychologists, a full-time social worker, as well as a part-time social worker, um, and the school resource officer, and Mrs. Emanuelson, our director of guidance. Um, as uh, Paul also said, if you have any concerns about your student's social emotional functioning, there is uh, no, 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 no harm in reaching out, please. Um, your school counselors often are the best uh, first step because they know you, they know your students, they know your family, um, but do not hesitate to reach out to anyone. And I do just want to point, um, parents, we have updated the mental health supports page on our school website. Um, I know the middle school has very similar structures. And if you uh, go to the DHS page under the parent section and the guidance department section, you'll see pictures of us <laughs> without masks, <laughs> um, as well as some information about how to contact us. Um, who we work with and what we do. And as you know, the structure um, for supports for 504, whether it's uh, supporting the 504 team by attending meetings, providing consultative support or being accessible to students, that stru structure is uh, exactly the same up here at the high school. And similarly for students with IEPs, if a, student, um, a student's social emotional functioning is really impacting their ability to access the general education curriculum, they may have individualized goals um, that are serviced by uh, individual school-based counseling time with a school psychologist or the school social worker. Um, and just that last bullet point here, I know we've used that acronym on a couple slides, so just to introduce it. Um, DBT stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And this is, um, in outside of schools, a therapeutic approach to um, promote uh, wellness and, and mental health um, that really is rooted in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and what it does is it kind of pairs the hallmarks of CBT in um, promoting emotional um, awareness uh, our, of our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, how those interact, um, as well as how they interact with the environment around us um, to promote healthy emotional functioning or where we get tripped up and we experience um, some difficulties. Um, so there is um, a wonderful team um, that the district consults with um, and we consult with here at the high school to help us transfer um, some of those DBT skills to school-based applications so that we're really focusing on skill building with students, building their awareness of their emotions, their emotional functioning, emotional regulation, distress tolerance, and skills such as that. So our school psychologists here were, and the social worker are all trained in DBT, as well as some school counselors. So we, we work on embedding um, that uh, kind of those skills and that perspective into the work we do with students. Um, one of the things that I'm going to speak about now is just the service continuum of specialized programs that we offer at DHS. I know that Megan Emanuelson spoke to you before about the eight periods that are scheduled. Um, and so we frame um, the program that we create for your child based on that eight periods, based on those eight periods. Um, we have different components of our program. We have learning center, direct reading instruction, related services, code talk classes, comprehensive classes. We have the core program and the Excel program. Um, my colleagues are going to speak more specifically to these, but I want to emphasize that even within each one, there is a range 
that we can offer to students. So when we're speaking out lear about Learning Center, for example, the standard offering for Learning Center is a block of Learning Center. So your child will work with their case manager during Learning Center. Um, they receive extra supports. They can work on their uh, goals and objectives during that time. But even in that, we have some students who may need the seven out of eight, others who may need four out of eight, and others who may need more. So when we have that articulation meeting, we will be working with you, the MMS team, and the DHS team to create a highly individualized program for your child. And that is something, of course, that we've revisited over the course of the years that they're with us as well. Um, as I said, we are going to have um, different individuals speak to each one specifically. So um, the co-teaching, I'm going to ask Katie, Gar uh, Katie Hall to speak. Yay. Okay, so um, as I mentioned at the start of the panel, I case manage 11th graders, but I'm a co-teacher in a freshman English class. I've been in the uh, co-teacher role in freshman English for the past three years. I'm biased, but I really think that the books that the students read freshman year are some of the most amazing books that are in our curriculum of Mice and Men to Kill a Mockingbird. Like it, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful year of books. Um, so similarly to the team teaching model, there are two teachers present in the classroom. However, um, in team teaching, it would be two content area teachers, like a history and a history teacher. With co-teaching, you have a content area teacher. So in my case, I have a you know, an English teacher, and then you have a special education teacher also in the room. And so the two of us work together and co collaborate to create lessons that align with our students with IEPs and their goals and objectives. So first and foremost, um, you know, if I was your child's co-teacher in English, I would be a service provider on his or her IEP, and I would be um, partially, if not fully, responsible for the implementation um, and monitoring of their goals and objectives. So my co-teacher and I are in frequent communication and we plan, we work really well together, but we plan all of our lessons together and we are constantly discussing the ways that we can sort of uh, adjust our curriculum to better support our students with IEPs. We've been working with uh, Dr. Marilyn Friend for the past few years, who's like the co-teaching guru. She's given us so many amazing tips and ideas for our classes. She's come to observe me for the past two years, and she's given me, you know, great feedback for me to work with and help better my instruction. So I wanted to give an example of what a co-taught lesson might look like. So currently in our co-taught English class, we are reading Lord of the Flies. Again, I'm biased, but like best curriculum ever, Lord of the Flies, the kids absolutely love it. Um, and so we have some students who have IEP goals based around monitoring character development throughout the course of a story, as well as identifying and supporting a theme of the book. So my co-teacher and I decided to put together a lesson plan where we used stations, meaning there were about five students per station, four stations total. One station was focused on theme, one station was focused on character development, one on symbolism, and one on conflict. We just use one chapter of Lord of the Flies instead of taking a whole book. Um, and we decided that I would teach the stations that were centered around character development and theme, since those are skills that our students with IEPs are working on. And my co-teacher would work on the symbolism and conflict skills with the other students. We strategically group these students so that way they are in a supportive group, um, a group that they feel like they can be successful with. And then I am able to collect data from that lesson to support that they are either satisfactorily making progress towards their goals and objectives, or if they need a bit more support. In addition to providing those um, lessons, we also provide so many materials. So if a student has graphic organizers, audiobooks, rephrased questions, wording, highlighting, I do all of that for any reading that we give. So any sort of passage, if there's difficult vocabulary, I'll go in and modify it to make sure that there is a simplified word used, really just to give our students access to the curriculum. Um, so if your student is recommended for a co-taught class, whether it be English or math, um, they are in wonderful hands. We have a really supportive team of teachers who collaborate with the other departments really nicely. Um, and like I said, they read wonderful books their freshman year, so they should be very excited about their English class, especially. Thank you, Katie. And next would be Rashid. 
Awesome. So our students at the high school receive learning center with IEPs, and this is going to be very similar to your resource center that the students are used to at the middle school. Um, at, at the LC and in, during LC, the students are engaging in mini lessons where these mini lessons are focused on some of the skills and the goals and objectives found in their IEPs, as well as working on content area specific assignments. Uh, a mini lesson uh, example could be, uh, I, ha I happen to case manage seniors this year and they're in the process of applying or being admitted to institutions for college. And the current students in my learning center are learning how to apply and advocate for accommodations at the college level. So there's many lessons around what types of accommodations that their schools provide, as well as the process on how to successfully apply for those accommodations. So when they leave here, they're really set up for success. Our mini lessons also can incorporate ideas of argumentative writing, adding textual evidence, and really supporting the services within their IEP. Um, it ends up being uh, our, our learning centers really end up being a home base for our students. I know kids at the high school find them to be very effective. They're allowed, uh, you know, depending on their frequency, uh, the students who come to learning center often uh, will come in for 10 to 15 minutes, work on the designated task, the mini lesson, and then break into uh, content area support with their case manager. So the case managers are also the learning center teachers uh, for their students. Uh, the school also has a testing center, and this is really an effective way for students who have extra time or need an alternate setting to have that support available to them. Uh, teachers in the general education setting, what they'll typically do is fill out a cover sheet that's given to our testing center uh, uh, proctor, and they're, a, they're allowed their extra time, uh, you know, reduce multiple choice if they have it, uh, and ability to ask clarifying questions. At the high school, we also have what's called comprehensive classes. And these comprehensive classes are modified academic classes that are aligned to uh, the curriculum of a 300 level course. And they're taught by a duly certified uh, colleague who is a special ed teacher, but also has a math uh, degree. And so the students are really able to absorb and focus on the skills that they need uh, in order to master the content. Um, so they're essentially a, a modified academic class and they align with the 300 level. And it's, it's, it's really, uh, as one of the comprehensive teachers at the high school, really using the student's strengths to combat some of their we relative weaknesses within the content area. So driving instruction at a pace that's really appropriate for the kids is huge. Uh, typically, if there is... Uh, a more challenging concept, we'll spend more time really trying to build the foundational skills because as we know with algebra, geometry, and algebra two, those are extremely fundamental classes and our kids who are struggling really need the support uh, and, and are supported through the comp comprehensive classes. And, and I, I should also note that these classes are also available for all the classes that are required for graduation. Awesome. So another support that we offer is direct reading support, similarly to the middle school. Um, I taught direct reading the past two years. This is my first year uh, just teaching or just being a co-teacher, I should say. So I can kind of talk through what the structure at the high school looked like. Um, similarly to the middle school, it's still in a small group setting, um, specially designed instruction centered around reading taught by a special education teacher. So the way that I used to teach my lessons, and I know that the current direct reading teachers do the same, is that we provide many lessons, similarly to what Rashid mentioned in the learning center model. Um, I would try to group my students who had similar skills that they needed to work on, things like nonfiction comprehension, fiction comprehension, uh, fluency, but if necessary, I would always do um, an individual mini lesson as well. If that student wasn't able to be grouped somewhere, we would just, you know, modify accordingly. Um, but the mini lessons, like I said, would be centered around the skills on their IEP. Um, and what we try to do is 
try to align it to the curriculum as much as possible. Um, that's where I noticed the most success with my students is that instead of providing them an additional fiction passage to read and find the main idea, let's work with chapter eight of Lord of the Flies that you're reading in English class. So that way it would support uh, the curriculum that they were working with. Western Civ tends to be challenging for our incoming freshmen. And so it was really helpful for my freshmen in direct reading last year. For example, if they had a fluency or decoding goal, I would go through one of their readings for Western Civ and I would pull out some multisyllabic words and we would preview those words before reading the passage and then measure fluency that way. We would also um, monitor uh, comprehension of nonfiction that way, uh, but we try to align it to the curriculum where appropriate. That way the students feel like they can be more successful and they have a better understanding of the content when they arrive at their classes. So Darien High School also has a program um, called the Excel program, which is a uh, uh, um, somewhat self-contained space within the building that has um, uh, the possibility for um, learning opportunities for vocational skills and life skills, uh, meaning that it has a fully operational kitchen, it has a washing machine and dryer um, so that students can learn living skills along with their academic content. Um, students who access the Excel program uh, access the program for a range of time. So some students might access it for um, a period of day. Some students might be accessing the program um, all day long. The program um, in non-COVID world makes community um, outings usually twice per week where they're uh, making recipes and, and making lists that they, of things they need from the grocery store, um, going to the library, many of the students um, you know, have pseudo jobs that they're, um, you know, that they're accessing in the community here in Darien as well, either person to person or at the library. Um, we hold person-centered planning meetings for many of these students where we're um, inviting all of their, um, their team members and their families to start to think about, you know, what does the future look, for, look like for that student based on who that student is uh, one year out, five years out, 10 years out, so that we can, uh, backwards map that into what we need to do for them while they're in the program. Uh, we collaborate with ABLIS um, to implement a healthy relationships curriculum that focuses on um, developing healthy relationships and understanding um, boundaries in healthy relationships. And uh, all the students in the program have access to participate in the unified sports program which happened in the fall, the winter, and the spring, and our Best Buddies program, which is a, a program that, um, uh, where students are, are sort of matched with typical peers for things, um, you know, as simple as, as going to lunch, but also, um, you know, uh, in, in community outings and um, things like, you know, bowling and things like that. An additional uh, support program we have within the DHS building itself is our core program. Um, and really what this is, is a pack, package of, of systematic supports um, to help students access uh, their education here in the building. Um, these students are, uh, it's really a program designed for students who are able to um, participate in general education, college preparatory classes, um, and they often are, are quite skilled um, academically. And this program really provides more structure, more accountability, and most essentially, more social emotional support to help them uh, do this and meet their full potential. Uh, students who um, are in the core program have um, some attention concerns, or difficulty getting to classes because of their social emotional functioning, um, or significant difficulties with work completion. Um, but of course, as with everything with an IEP, um, it's individualized. Uh, the program structure is such that, like I said, those kind of systematic supports um, is first and foremost that learning center that Rashid uh, spoke of occurs, um, is centralized and there is a core room in the high school building. It's a normal typical classroom um, that is staffed at all times during the day um, by a special education teacher um, and or a paraprofessional as well. Um, so we do have that consistency, that accountability, and that access for support. Um, the students have their learning center in that room, and they leave that room to go access uh, their wonderful classes that we have here. Um, they, the program is also supported by our school social worker. 
so that uh, she is down there quite frequently to help problem solve with students um, and support their learning, helping them um, kind of get through their day if it's a, it's a rough day. Um, and the social worker and the special education teacher also co-lead community. Um, so as a part of that package of support, students in the core program meet together twice in an eight day cycle um, to work on um, you know, some group um, counseling approach to those DBT skills, um, as well as to foster positive, positive social relationships um, and really learn from one another. Um, the uh, core program uh, is again, inside the school building. Um, and it is for students who are, are really capable of accessing um, a typical college preparatory uh, education here. All right, so uh, thank you for um, listening to our presentation. I know we presented a lot of information. There's a lot of questions and answers flying through the chat here. Um, we did want to offer you an opportunity to ask questions privately as well. So my email is or maybe not up on the screen anymore, but I'll put it in the chat just so everybody has it. And if you have any questions that you wanted to ask that are more general um, that you didn't want to ask in front of the entire group, you can feel free to email me and I will point the question in the, uh, in the right direction of our panelists. Give everybody a few minutes just to send in questions. You can, again, continue to use the chat. I just know that um, some of the, uh, the things in the chat might not be getting answered as, as other ones come in. Dr. McCarthy, I think there were also some parent questions that were submitted with registration that were sent to us. So um, I can put those out while we're waiting for people to formulate theirs. Great, thank you. Um, so one of the questions was, what is the relation of required classes to electives? So, um, in general, students are scheduled for their four core classes, and then the fifth period is a is their biology lab, PE health. Um, if students are taking a world language, uh, students are taking a study hall, learning center, related services. So it really depends on the student's program, um, and that will be discussed in great detail at um, at the PPT and the articulate. Um, one, it's a question, a couple of questions about um, co-taught classes that'll be available for next year. Don't know who wants to take that. Um, trying to find that one in there. That was the one in the, that was sent to us ahead of time. Classes we have co-taught English. We have co-taught history that will be available next year, um, and uh, for the freshmen, for the freshmen coming up. And then um, I think we talked about team taught versus lab. So I think we've, we've covered that. Um, um, what's the place to handle anxiety? Um, and how do we support current middle school students um, in terms of the rising increased academic expectations here at Darien High School? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think that what is helpful is um, to differentiate between um, predicting the future and uh, appropriately coping ahead for the future. Um, so we don't want to get into a pattern of, uh, you know, thinking everything is going to be so hard and so overwhelming and, you know, kind of letting our minds spin with those worries and fears. Um, but what can help is, is systematically uh, coping ahead and um, gathering information, gathering structures, um, and supports and thinking about routines um, and especially knowing who uh, your students' resources are. I think students um, are much more comfortable their first couple weeks of the school year. All ninth graders you know, are uncomfortable, right? Um, but they especially are more comfortable if they know um, who to go to for what they need. Um, we are always happy to uh, meet with students uh, you know, before the school year starts and school counselors are usually in here a couple days ahead of time and you know, can say hi and um, get, introduce themselves to you. Um, this is also an opportunity with uh, the case managers and that round robin um, that Katie Hall mentioned, right? We can learn a little more about your student. Um, and of course, if they have a direct service, you'll learn who their service provider is. Um, 
but really just helping them have some information um, and be able to kind of uh, predict and, and know what they're walking into as much as possible. And then we'll take it from there. Don't worry, they'll, they'll be in good hands next year. Yeah, I would, I would add that, you know, there's a whole team here, you know, sort of looking at the, at the team on the screen. So everybody has a school counselor, but um, even if your, your student is not IEP or scheduled for formal counseling services, we work very, very closely with our school psychologists and our social workers. So um, our teachers are amazing about identifying a student who might need some additional support. So they'll, they might refer a student to us, but so they might come down to the school counselor. They might be introduced to the school psychologist. So there's always someone who they can talk to if they're having um, a difficult time. And I would say, if you have a child who um, tends to be a little bit more anxious or is feeling anxious, I think we're all, it's a pandemic. I think we're seeing a lot of anxiety, but if you have a child who is um, particularly anxious or, or leading into high school is feeling that way, please just reach out. Um, let us know that ahead of time and then we can take some proactive steps to work with you to try and smooth that transition ahead of time. Uh, um, Meg, just to add, I neglected to mention that we also have co-taught algebra. Thank you. Um, when a child has been encouraged to self-advocate but is not willing or is not capable, um, so who, who will sort of be their, their advocate? And I would, my response will be probably pretty similar to what the, the response I just get. We have a whole team. Um, if I could, if I could bottle uh, self-advocacy, I would be a retired person. So that's something that we certainly, it's an emerging skill for ninth graders, for almost all ninth graders. It's something that we, we thread throughout our program here. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think every, every person that you see on the screen is an advocate for your child. And so, um, you can reach out to anybody, um, if your child needs help communicating with a teacher or talking to another adult in the building. Um, any any of the adults in their life can certainly help them to develop those skills. And, and I would like to add that that is also, I, I don't know if you were going to say the same thing, Katie, is that I see the continuum from ninth grade to 12th grade, even post high school, as that sometimes being a goal for so, some students. Some yeah. students are great self-advocates, some need to start in ninth grade, but even when we're talking about those uh, post high school transition goals, that is something that our senior teachers are still working on with some students. So students are prepared when they leave VHS to know how to advocate for themselves as, as learners. Um, I was going to add to that, Christina and Rashid, I'm sure you were gonna say the same, that this is sort of embedded within our learning center curriculum. One of the first activities that I had my students do when they were freshmen was learn how to send an email, which I always tell the story, I thought it was gonna take five minutes. It took 45 minutes and then we needed to pick up with it the next day because everyone was like, what? I don't understand what this means. How do I do this? So um, we start working on those skills, you know, right when they get here. Case managers, especially with students with IEPs, we are the student's biggest cheerleaders. Like we have their back no matter what. Um, I have been to extra help sessions with my students that my students who were a little bit shyer and didn't feel confident. I was like, you know what? I'm not really getting meiosis and mitosis either. Let's go together. And then I would go with my student. And then eventually they were like, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to go by myself. So we really are there to support your student with whatever it is that they need. Um, and if they are having difficulty with self-advocacy, we will be their advocate while also working with them to advocate on their own. And like Christina said, it's not something that happens overnight, but I have had my students since freshman year and seeing their progression from freshman year to now is unbelievable. Um, they have just become so independent and it's really amazing. Those were the questions that were sent to us privately, so. Megan, there was a question submitted um, asking about foreign language, um, how that works in a schedule and are there a typical number of years anticipated or um, looked for? And also a question related to that, um, has there been any thought about um, sign language um, or alternative uh, language requirements at, at the school? So um, the, the, as you might've heard, the graduation requirements have changed effective from the state of Connecticut, effective with the class of 23. So if you, those are our current sophomores. So if you have an older student, um, these graduation requirements will be different. And the graduation requirements are on the guidance page of the um, Darien High School um, website. And again, your, your school counselors will very closely monitor the graduation requirements and make sure people are, are moving towards that. But as part of the new graduation requirements, there is a one-year world language requirement. 
And so um, that is that's a that's a state um, that's part of the state graduation requirement. So um, students are expected to take one year. Um, and I would say that our world language chair, Christina Mauricio, is always considering um, new options. She's always she's she's um, always looking to expand um, opportunities that are available for our students. Um, options for language. Um, students can continue with um, French or Spanish, and um, we also offer Mandarin and Latin. Thanks, Megan. Um, could I also circle back to the conversation about Excel and just ask how many classrooms there are um, for the Excel program? How many classrooms there are for the Excel program? There are actually two spaces that are connected, and then there's um, another kind of office space if a student needs to work in a smaller setting. Uh, one of them seems to be more of an academic space. The other one has the kitchen um, and the washer and dryer, but there are two uh, larger spaces that are connected together. And as uh, Dr. McCarthy mentioned before, we have some students who do have most of their classes in the Excel class in the Excel room, but we have a number of students who have a base class in Excel, but then spend most of their day in mainstream classes with support. So there's a continuum even within the Excel program. And if I can just offer one last question that came in during the registration process. Um, and as a parent of a 12th grader, I'll tell you it'll all get there, but here's an eighth grade parent asking, what's the process over the four years at DHS to prepare students for college and beyond when accommodations or support may not be available to the same degree provided by DHS? So that's a great question. And I think a lot of the uh, case managers at the high school definitely keep that in mind. Uh, my philosophy and a lot of in the philosophy of my colleagues is to really create an environment where the kids are picking and choosing and using the skills that they develop with us and keeping it in their toolbox for future use. Um, you know, uh, Katie is the same way. I like to try to challenge my students as they progress through uh, the high school and, you know, really getting them to understand and articulate what accommodations work, which ones are essential, and then also giving them the information that not all of these accommodations found on their page eight are available at the next level. So it's almost, you know, they have a safety net here at the high school and we try to provide that safety net, but at the same time, we expose them to some of that anxiety of leaving and maybe not being able to have their page eight to, to the T. Uh, a lot of my students currently entering semester two as seniors, we've scaled back through the PPT process, uh, the accommodations that they're going to be using and that are outlined in their page eight. And I think this allows the students to really have a pared down accommodation that's going to reflect the supports that they'll most likely utilize at the post-secondary level. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we ask that our students come to the PPTs. Um, it is, first of all, it's a fantastic experience for them. Um, we try to make it very positive and, and uplifting. Um, so I always, and Rishi does the same, we all do this with our students. We sit down with them before the PPTs. We go over their goals and objectives. We go over their accommodations with them. And we'll say, tell me which accommodations are you feel are the most helpful for you at this moment. Freshman year, it's typically a lot more, which is which is fine. It's completely we expect that. Um, now speaking with juniors, you know they'll look back and be like, oh, I needed highlighted keywords, you know, when I was a freshman, but I don't really need that anymore. I kind of do it myself because I learned active reading strategies. Like we try to teach the skills that will help the students be successful in their post secondary careers. Um, and so we do like when they are a part of their PPT because then it helps us to see what they really do need. Um, and we do have those conversations about some of the accommodations that will be available in college and some that won't. And uh, one thing I'm, I'd like to add, so our students at the high school who are receiving support at either during learning center or in the co-talk classes can really start to identify and actually name the supports mm -hmm. they're using and the strategies, which is awesome to see. And the kids can really develop a way of applying them and generalizing them through all their academic classes and show mastery that, hey, you know, this, this might be a really weak area and I have these skills that I can use such as X, Y, and Z to help me get over this roadblock.
Christina, this is Lisa Cerusi. Um, we have a number of questions in the Q&A box and also in the chat. I, I believe a, several of them have been addressed already, but um, I don't know if you can see those two boxes, but I'm happy to read those questions aloud for anybody who wants to answer. Yeah, could you read them aloud, please? Thank you, Lisa. Sure. Um, Somebody has asked, um, may we purchase textbooks for classes such as Western Civ so students can preview material over the summer? Where and how do we do that? Meg, are you able to answer that question? I know, I, I, I know personally that I have bought a textbook for one of my own children before, but I had to wait until the class assignment to know what uh, textbook the teacher was using. So I don't know if in the summer that that information is available. Meg, is, do you think? So I would say, I, I think a lot of our, our teachers have moved to online resources, online textbooks, secondary sources. Um, so the, if you have a concern about a particular subject area like this site's West Civ, I would touch base with the department chair um, who might be able to tell you, you know, what, what resources and what um, books they're using so that you um, can see what's available um, online ahead of time. But that's probably a great question for our department chairs. Uh, another question uh, that has come in uh, is about, well, there's a few questions about language. Um, some people are asking uh, for clarification on what the languages are. And also um, one person writes, um, my eighth grader struggles uh, if he chooses another, I'm assuming language, uh, is it just another door of challenges? Are there other options that may not seem obvious? Um, so that's one question and uh, language requirements, if you can also speak to that. Yep, so for um, the current rising freshman, the state has deemed a one year world language requirement. Options are um, Spanish, French, Mandarin, or Latin. If a student has been taking a language, they can continue with that language. If a student has not been taking a language or would like to switch languages, they can start with a level one language in any of those. So Latin one, Mandarin one, Spanish, or French. Um, some students, um, and again, this is really good information to be talking about at the articulation meetings, both 504 and PPTs. Some students won't take a language the first year. Um, that's possible as well. So it's not something that necessarily has to be completed the first year if we want to allow for the transition and other programmatic needs. Um, I, I, I say this only anecdotally, I have no scientific research for this, but I have heard that sometimes very counterintuitively, Mandarin is actually somewhat easier because it is visual um, and symbolic. And so sometimes students who have struggled with a traditional world language soar in Mandarin and kind of blows my mind because you know it's Chinese. Um, so we have seen students who have struggled with a traditional, say, French or Spanish, come into Mandarin and just take off because it is so, it's so visual. Um, so I don't know if, you know, obviously, Katie and Rashid sort of shaking their head. I don't know if they have any direct experience with that. Um, what I was going to say, Megan, um, just from the language standpoint, um, at your child's articulation PPT, we will discuss um, the services that they receive as well as elective choices for their first year at high school. Um, Kate Williamson, I know that you used to like literally draw it on the board, like all eight periods, like the mini blocks, so we could see what the students would be taking their freshman year. But it's not uncommon for students to not take a language their freshman year. I had a lot that did not um, and are now taking Spanish. Some of them even started with a language this year. You know, everybody's on their own individual path. There's not like a one size fits all that works for everyone. So we do have conversations more specific to your child and their needs and their program during the articulation PPTs. And we also um, consider, of course, I know it's been said, but the related services. If a student has um, a full-time learning center that will take up some time in their schedule, of course, um, to great benefit, it's very, very worth it. Um, and they also may have, for example, a period or two in the eight day rotation with the speech language pathologist. Um, they may have, um, again, some counseling time um, with a school psychologist or social worker. So those um, are also pieces of the puzzle. And those are also reasons um, to Megan's point why students may not take a language in that first ninth grade year. And I, I did put this in the chat, but just so that it's been said to everyone, um, for the purposes of what we'll be doing with eighth graders next week when we're working in classrooms, 
I know there's sort of, it feels like a little bit up in the air. And so we have these articulation PPTs about what they'll have room for. Um, we're gonna have the students input electives um, just as we would for any student. And then I think it's just really great information. I know when I go to those articulation PPTs, I think it's important to say the student's really interested in taking ceramics or the student is really interested in taking woodworking. And so we're going to have um, students complete the, the elective selection process next week. Um, it wouldn't be a bad idea maybe as a parent just to say, you know, we're going to be having a PPT meeting. We're going to be talking about what's possible in your schedule and what supports you receive. Um, and just so that they, they know that coming in. Um, we won't be having them put Learning Center into as, as an elective, even though um, it is a part of their schedule, because again, that'll be determined by the PPT. So for the purposes of next week, we're going to have the mentor electives um, of their choosing. And then that can be adjusted if there's not room for it. That can be you know, discussed at the, at the PPT. If there's not room for it, we can always make adjustments to their elective selections. Um, but we're going to have them input it next week. OK, uh, another question uh, regarding Excel. Uh, is it just? Uh, are there two dedicate two out of the sixteen special education teachers that are dedicated to Excel, or does that change or rotate? How does that work? The number of teachers involved with Excel is impacted by the number of students that are currently assigned to Excel. So this year, I have one Excel teacher. That may look different next year. Thank you. Uh, I know we talked about, uh, Christina, you answered the question about the co-taught classes and what we're currently offering. Um, in terms of lab classes, can you explain uh, the, what's offered for lab? Lab is a general education, so I have to ask Megan to answer that one. That's a that's a general education support. That's not. Um, we may speak about it at the at the articulation PPT, and we'll document it. But it isn't being that the lab isn't provided by a special education teacher. It's not a part of their their page eleven grid. So Megan, if you could speak to the lab offerings, please. I'll I'll jump in, Megan, if you want. I'll give I'll give you a break from talking. So. <laughs> Um, when, when it comes to the labs, um, you know, like in ED supports, uh, a lot of it is dependent on the request that we receive. So uh, typically in, in previous years, what we've done is we've offered a, a lab in our math classes. Um, up until Algebra 2, we've offered labs in our uh, English classes. Um, uh, we've offered labs in uh, history. Um, we haven't offered labs in science. Um, our science classes already come associated with the lab, so for scheduling purposes, there's just difficulty doing the labs for that. Um, in, in regards to that, too, I, I'll move on um, it, it, for the team talk, going back to, you know, in regards to the general ed supports. Um, you know, again, depending on the content area, uh, we've had instances where we've had uh, team talk classes in some of our English um, uh, history, math classes, science classes. Um, this year, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, you know, we didn't have uh, any of the team talk classes in some of our English and our math classes, but um, I know there's a question in the Q&A about the upcoming budget and things like anything every year with the upcoming budget, you know, we have things that we offer and things may be changed, not only based on budget, but also based on the needs of the kids and what the requests are. So, you know, we have had opportunities just because there's a co-taught class, let's say in English, doesn't mean that there's not other supports for there too. So the, the, the one thing that I wanna say that I really do value in my time of being here at the, at the high school is we, we really do take the time to look at the individual student and look at the needs of the student and uh, not just for students that have IEPs and 504s, but even for students that don't have those. And when we have these articulation meetings, we'll go through with you know, all the options with each student and try to address those during those meetings. And, you know, oftentimes we leave those meetings and things are good to go and we don't have any other changes. There are plenty of times that we leave those meetings and there are things that are still up in the air and we make adjustments afterwards. Um, you know, the thing I can tell you is that we'll continue to try to work and try to help support your kids as best as possible. Um, we work all throughout the summer as, as adjustments need to be made. Um, sometimes there's considerations with staffing, sometimes there's considerations with budget. I mean, there's lots of things that go into it, but ultimately we're trying to support your kids and trying to help them as best as possible. So, you know, with the supports, that, that's the, the 
general answer, I guess, for the, the general ed support. So when we have the RTIC for your child or when they have the RTIC for the 504 student down at Middlesex, um, we will definitely revisit these um, options with you during those meetings. Paul, if I could add to that, one of the things that is, I know Dr. McCarthy shared his email, but all our emails were at the beginning. Um, and as you can see my name on the screen, my email is cbrostaylor at darianps.org. Please do not hesitate to reach out and ask a question. Um, I, from now through to the end of the year, and even in the summer, Megan and I uh, met last summer, the first few weeks before school started, we went through every single IEP, we went through every single schedule three times to make sure that your child walked in the door, uh, the ninth grade, incoming ninth grade students walked in the door and that everything was seamlessly prepared for them. And there were discussions those days before school started as well. But if you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Teresa and I talk, have spoken this week at least four times just talking about the transition. So we are doing everything to make sure that your child is set to walk in the door and have a seamless transition. <clears throat> but if you or the parent are concerned, ask after this meeting, please feel free to, to ask. Christina, do we have time for two questions that are still in the unanswered we have a few more minutes yeah yeah of course please okay. uh somebody has asked is there any writing support i understand there is reading support uh but actually helping kids initiate a difficult writing assignment especially the three-part thesis papers that occur later in years i look at my two uh special education teachers who are present that is a huge part of the of the learning center support um there is that continual con uh, communication with the regular education teachers, and absolutely there's writing support that happens during the learning center time, absolutely. Thank you. And somebody has asked, um, I'm gonna read this directly from them. Typically for every 10 kids coming into DHS as ninth graders with an IEP, how many excel in the high school environment? and how many really seem to struggle, just trying to get a typical, an idea of the typical bell curve. Uh, and I know this is a hard question to ask, answer, but. Um, this is a, I, I would say that this is a hard question to answer because one, this has been a very different year. This has been a very unique year. What I do think is hugely important is the communication. So my team, it pretty much is the practice that they reach out to parents at least every two weeks. There's constant communication with the regular education teachers. The student is engaged in that conversation and there are continuum of supports. So uh, sometimes something comes up with the school counselor that we become aware of and we provide us an amount of support. And as if things get better, we reduce the support. If things Stay the same, we maintain that support, whether it's emotional or academic. Um, the other thing that I think is hugely vital is your ninth grader is now a high school student and you want to foster that independence. But you as the parent, if you see that your child is struggling with anything, we do ask you to be a, an active part of that communication as well, because there may be some things that are clearly evident to us and we'll take the lead on adding those supports, but other times it's something you're aware of and we're not. So, or if you feel that someone, that there's something else that needs to be done, reach out to us because we create the IEP at the articulation PPT. But if at any point we need to change those services by adding something or reducing something, we have program reviews. Just this week, I had a, a ninth grade mother reach out to me. Her daughter is having a hugely successful year and she goes, you know what? She doesn't need seven out of eight LCs. Can we reduce it to four? That's fantastic. In other instances, we meet on a student and we increase from seven to, to nine. Yes, that has impact on schedule, but if it's what the student needs, it's what we do. So I would say for your child, just we just all need to be in, in constant communication if there's any problem in making sure that we provide the exact amount of support for your child to make them successful and foster independence. Okay, last uh, two questions, I think, are, uh, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, and to all parents, as Christina mentioned, we're, uh, we do have to wrap up the, the meeting time, but everybody on the panel is available for questions by email. Uh, for kids who have a 504 who do not have Learning Center, where does the writing support come from? 
I think that that's thread really from from day one of English class. I think our our English department and and our history department, where there's you know tends to be heavier writing. I think they do a beautiful job of um, of setting students up with rubrics and templates and exemplars. I would strongly encourage um, a writing conferences. So some teachers will mandate that, but your your student can also as part of that self advocacy piece and um, and be working on you know writing conferencing. Um, writing conferencing, there's some some peer writing support as well, which sometimes, again, I've got two teenagers, sometimes students just have a way of explaining things to other students that just clicks and makes sense. And so if your student is open to some peer writing support, um, that's an initiative in the English department with our National English Honor Society as well. Um, so again, I think it's beautifully thread and worked on every, in every single one of our classes that have writing with those teachers and um, some of it is built in and structured and some of it is certainly um, things that your student can take advantage of. Thanks, Meg. And final question, when will my child's schedule be provided? Oh, the million dollar one save for last, right? Um, so again, in a typical year, we do try and provide that um, a few weeks ahead of school beginning. Um, I, I, I really don't want to necessarily commit to something, a specific date. We haven't determined that date yet, um, but certainly know that we're going to work really hard to, to build the schedule and to have that information in your hands as soon as we can. But we do make lots of things change. We do make adjustments all summer. We're balancing. We have staffing changes. So there's a lot of things that happen with the schedule over the summer. So um, my hope would be, you know, a week or two before school starts. But um, depending on how um, the rest of the year evolves, it, it may not be that. So please don't hold me to that. Great, and thank you to all our panelists this morning and everyone who um, registered will receive a copy of the PowerPoint uh, from this morning. I'll send that out um, to you just this morning. So thank you again to everybody. Um, and you've got a great team of people here, so please reach out to them and welcome again to the high school. Have a good day.